Hello, it's Jen Top. Welcome back to Booked Up, a podcast that features you, me, and our favorite authors. This week, my guest is Steve Phillips. Steve is the author of two bestsellers. His first book was Brown is the New White, and the new one, How We Win the Civil War, Securing a Multiracial Democracy and Ending White Supremacy for Good. A true Renaissance man, Steve was a civil rights lawyer, political activist, columnist, and also is the founder of Democracy in Color, the organization and podcast. Oof, talk about energy. Okay, let's dive in. Hi, Steve. Hello. Where are you? Are you in California? Yeah, I'm in San Francisco, dealing with the downpour. Is that like an attic, Finnish attic area? Attic area yes, this it? is the attic in my house. Is this where you do the podcast also? It is not actually. I mean, sometimes we. I have a podcast studio in my basement that is more, um, even more soundproofed. I've got like the stuff on the walls and the ceiling and the soundproofing and whatnot and the, what do you call it, the movers, rugs, or whatnot. Um, wow. So I kind of go back and forth between here and there, depending. I, I found out about you through my friend, Spencer Overton. I've known him mm-hmm. since law school. We both grew up in the Detroit area. Um, yeah. How do you know Spencer? Well, it's so funny you're saying this. Like, Spencer's from Detroit? I just kind of know Spencer from the movement. Um, I mean, we met in law school. I didn't know him in Michigan, though, but we were, you know. Yeah, no, I know him more through, like, D.C. politics, uh-huh. social change stuff, um, just kind of over the past, I don't know, decade or so, something like that. So, but it's one of those people's like, where did we actually meet? But it's a, it's been in that D.C. social change milieu. Yeah, I mean, you're you're certainly a, a, a big part of that. I think he mentioned you because he knew I was launching this podcast and with, you know, I'm interested in the work he does with the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. I just saw he did a, um, a review of your, of your new book that we're, that we're talking about today. Yeah, he did. That was very generous of him. So. Yeah. I also want to say um, that I'm really sorry for your loss. I know, um, I know of Susan, that she is a very remarkable person. It's hard for me to use the past tense. Um, and you did dedicate your new book, how we win the civil war to her. Is it okay if I read that dedication to you? (sighs) The reality of cancer forces one to a more spiritual place of contemplating life, meaning, and legacy. That reflection has fueled my work on this book to try to make it a lasting legacy for both of us. You worked together, have known her for more than 30 years. How did you meet and what was that relationship like? Um, well, I, I went through the, um, our, uh, I did clean out our basement. Um, I had like stuff there from we moved into this house in 2006 where you just put in the basement that like eventually we'll get to it. And of course, mm-hmm. never got to it. And I came across these documents. So there's a fairly, whatever, famous story in our little family about how we almost met in college, but it was good that we didn't Uh. at that time. And so I was, this was in the mid 80s. I was chairman of the Black Student Union, very involved in the Free South African movement. And this is in college at Stanford? This was in college at Stanford in, uh, in in the mid 1980s. And then Susan was involved in, um, like consensus decision making with Farsi, <laughs> right? So a lot of, you know, I just, I'm just, yeah, <laughs> white lefty progressive types, and, and it actually turns out that one of my good friends, um, actually Stacy Layton, because you're in the law. Stacy was a, a Supreme Court clerk um, back in the day at Stanford Law School. <clears throat> For whatever reason, she thought that <laughs> Susan and the kind of like Susan's crowd should come teach us how to do decision making. And so, the, so you're going to have this, you know, white grouping of folks. And this was a, she'd done like butcher paper and put stuff together and whatnot. <laughs> but I don't know if the word just didn't get to us or what, but um, we didn't show up. And um, we all agree it was best that we did not in terms of that would not have been an auspicious beginning. Yeah. But um, no, we met at a education reform 
conference. I mean, actually, because it is, you know, tied together in terms of the arc of the story. So my first job out of, when I left college, was in um, at a school forum project in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Um, working with public interest law firm, public advocates, called the Collaboration for Educational Excellence. And so Susan's family helped to fund that. And the uh, program officer, Sylvia E, she says, oh, Susan Sanders says she knows you. You were at Stanford together. Because I had the you know, higher profile in the Free South Africa movement or whatever. And so I started asking around about her. One of my good friends from college, um, Lisa Neely, is like, oh, I went to high school with her. She studies a lot, was one of the first things that she had said. <laughs> and then we went to the school reform conference at University of San Francisco. Um, that's where we met. I think we were each on each other's radar because I was running, I was working on this project and that she, you know, her family had, had funded, I had heard of her. And um, I mean, it's just also kind of funny and crazy. So it's like... We're sitting next to each other at this conference about school reform in California. And I, I like lean over to her and said, well, this is all fine, but how are we going to change the whole state of California? <laughs> so I, I think that was like a great line in terms of get, capturing her attention and interest. And so we kind of set out from there on a journey to do social change, education reform originally, and then on to the broader political change. So, If you had met I mean, if you, at that time, it seems like, I'm just guessing that you both were coming at a similar problem in different ways. I, I We might have been in college at the same time, and that was when um, my friends who were part of the divestment movement, um, I, I was at Yale, they were trying to, you know, there were huge protests on Beinecke Plaza. I have friends who were arrested for sit-ins and expelled from school. I don't think they were looking at you know, sort of non-confrontational politics at the time. Is that what you're getting at? Is it, that it wouldn't have been the best way to meet if you had met then? Or? Yes, very much. We were, <laughs> uh, I mean, it was, you know, people were marching through the streets in yeah. South Africa facing yeah. being shot down. And um, it was a very intense period and a very intense struggle. And so it was, it was really more about building power, fighting back, withstanding these attacks was what was top of mind mm-hmm. more so than consensus decision making. It's interesting because I um, I did not know your connection with her and in just thinking about it, how much her family has supported some of the organizations where many of my friends have worked or where I have gone to events. Um, I have a good friend from law school who um, who is now... Um, in the cabinet, and she worked for the Center uh, for Responsible Lending. I wrote a book on the savings and loan, well, the connection between the savings and loan debacle in the 2008 financial crisis and toxic mortgages. And obviously with that, and of course, ProPublica is an incredible organization. Um, yeah. And then you had uh, Joe Nacero on your podcast. Oh, yes. Right? I adore Joe. Yeah, yeah. And so he wrote a very big piece on Susan's parents in, um, I think it was 2006. Probably when he was um, a Times columnist. Yes, he was at the yeah. Times around, you know, the credible track record that they had had. And then, you know, if you worked on the savings and loan mm. in the industry, what got lost, the, all of the craziness is that a loan among all the institutions they held on to their loans. Yeah. They were not making bad loans yes. and selling them off. The they people. were not I mean, doing originate to distribute. Right. Right. No, they they made good loans and held on to them. And that was right. an extraordinary business for them. And then they created the Center for Responsible Lending because they were really very um, passionate about um, ethics and business. And so that you know translated over to their philanthropy. And then, you know, Susan kind of inherited that philanthropy um, tradition. I, I, I actually should not even say that. Susan actually started them on the philanthropic tradition. Oh, and so in like the, late the young 80s, kids saying, "Hey, get get the, get involved." Oh, interesting. Yes, oh, tell me this. Oh, exactly. Okay. So she told she was in the late eighties. She was saying, "Shouldn't we be doing something in philanthropy?" And that got the family conversations started, and they started interviewing different potential staff people, looking at different program areas, and so she was the impetus for that. Mm. So that's, you know, I think the is, is a relevant part of the story. And, you know, I mean, I've been, I've been kind of 
you know, anybody who knows me would not be surprised, you know, utilizing Facebook as my, like, platform of choice. When I turned 50, Susan organized a secret uh, Facebook group for people to post on Facebook. Which was, it, was a, uh, <laughs> it, it was the perfect balance of, you know, not overwhelming, but being connected to people, et cetera. And so I've been kind of having this rolling memorial on, on mm. Facebook about Susan. And it said something about how we had, what we had was a love story for the ages. Mm. And we transcended barriers of race, religion, and class to find each other, forge a life together, and set about trying to change the world. And I think that's very true. She brought me into that world, helped to empower me and understand it, and then tried to put those resources to the cause that, you know, poverty, economic justice, racial justice that, you know, we both cared passionately about. I know you probably know uh, from the Jewish tradition, there's an expression, may her memory be for a blessing. Mm. And uh, I know that you are living, your, you know, through her and your work continues. Um, and, and speaking of your work, I, um, your recent book, how we win the civil war. <clears throat> I, I really, um, I want to talk about this subject matter, but I really fell in love with you. I not fell in love, but with your mind, with your writing, because you bring a sense of humor to this and humanity. Um, and you're very thoughtful about um, the reader's experience. And so I want to, I want to, point out um, one of these things that you wrote that that I found that made me laugh out loud um, because the this, this subject matter is urgent and serious, but right. it's been urgent and serious for hundreds of years. Um, and if we can't laugh uh, along the way, what are we doing here? And so you were reminding us about the Paul Revere riding through Massachusetts towns on horseback. And we've all heard, you know, I don't know if he actually said this, but we always supposedly he said, the British are coming, the British are coming, you know, trying to warn people of the, of the you know, impending invasion. And then you write, um, imagine if Revere had instead ambled down the street saying, we're going to invite the British to dinner and see if we can reach a bipartisan agreement. Cinema and mansion are bringing the clam chowder. And I just, and to me that encapsulates, you know, that could, you know, that cut, to me that's like channeling MLK from Letter from Birmingham Jail. This is like mm. the white moderate, like not getting it. And I, and I just, and then you sort of made this comment saying, I'm not trying to be flip. Okay, maybe I am. Do you find that when you're writing about this, you're just cracking yourself up with jokes all the time? Or why do you decide to include these asides? Because I enjoy them. I don't know if it's all the time, but I think <laughs> that the, um, well, you know, Charlene Chang was my book editor, or um, both of my books had made this point about trying to put more of myself into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I did want it to be very accessible. Um, and that's, um, that's also something that Susan had really impressed upon me was the importance of stories and really trying to be use stories that, that this material could be accessible. So that I think that's, that's part of it. But also it's there well, for one, it was helpful to be able to take the historical sweep. Um right. really looking from the Civil War all the way up to now, and then to really understand and have more confidence. And so I thought there was a kind of a subliminal dimension to it in terms of, I think that progressive people in general, people talking about, you know, racial justice in particular, are categorized as being angry. And there's a subliminal dimension to that is that you're angry because you're disempowered. Mm. And, but if you are actually feeling more powerful, you can kind of laugh at the absurdity of what other people are suggesting and what strategies and things that they're talking about because they're so detached from the uh, uh, grounding in the historical reality. So that, I think, was a conscious and intentional dimension because it's to give the emotion of confidence that we are right. This analysis is correct, and we can actually mock people who have this other approach and do so secure in the, in, the, in, the, in the knowledge that the facts back us up. Yeah, I think that's a really good observation. It's funny you should, you should say that the ability to laugh shows that you have more power than when you're angry. There's this um, 
line that sticks with me from one of my um, English literature classes from college, and it was that irony is the discourse of the disempowered. But I suppose I suppose anger is even one step lower on the ladder of power. That makes a yeah. lot of sense. Now, there's a line from one of Mao, Mao Zedong's books where he refers to the, 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 the evolution of movements and the communities. And he refers to the, sm- the machine smashing phase. <laughs> and that has always struck with me because that's an early but relatively unsophisticated but understandable phase of you're just lashing out and you're just going to do machine smashing. Mm. And then you kind of evolve from there to how you really get and wield power. Mm-hmm. So the other thing I appreciated, again, before we even get to um, the argument, the polemic in this book, is the author's note that, that begins the book. And it shows that, you know, you kind of want to, ex- you don't want people wondering why you made certain choices. Mm-hmm. Um, so you set out and explain them. <clears throat> and there are two. The, the first relates to um, uh, using names. And the second relates to um, sort of, a, you know, a, um, a punctuation issue. So um, the first thing is you note that um, you're going to use people's full names, um, their first name and their surname, but that if you know them well, the second time around, you'll call them by their first name. Can you tell me a little bit more about that decision and why you f- felt it was important to explain your choice there? Because there's historically been a, uh, and actually I think you mentioned Martin Luther King, and, it, uh, and you even mentioned this letter from a Birmingham jail. He has this um, line in there, which also makes me think about so much of the things that have shaped you when you're growing up. Mm. So when I was in elementary school, I read Letter from Birmingham Jail. You and were there young. was a wow. passage. I must have been an odd kid. <laughs> there was a <laughs> passage <laughs> that I wrote out by hand and put into a plastic bag and sealed it. Oh my god! And so and it's there. There is this, and it's like a sentence that is almost a whole paragraph wrong, long where he talks about, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. And he goes mm-hmm. through this whole litany really of, you know, indignities and abuses. And one of the things he mentions is, um, I forget the exact wording, but it's like when your first name is John and your middle name is Boy, regardless of what your name is. So names have always been very important and um, as a form of disrespect, particularly mm-hmm. to people of color, and particularly to women of color. And there's also been a piece around people, um, you know, working very hard for ti- for their titles and for their for the respect that comes with the name. And so, sure. people have historically used the first names of people as a way of disrespecting them. Yeah. Um, well, this is the the uh, that line stuck with me for whatever fifty years. Sydney Poitier and uh, um, in the heat of the night, it mm-hmm. says, "What do they call you up there?" Um, Virgil, and he says, they call me Mr. Tibbs. And that's resonated with me for decades. And so I wanted to be mindful of that and not to play into the disrespect that comes from not using a person's last name. But at the same time, I think part of the problem politically is that people, particularly positions of power, don't resonate with leaders who look different from them. And so they don't feel the emotional connection and enthusiasm from somebody like a Stacey Abrams the way they do, frankly, with a person like Pete Buttigieg. It's like there's an undercurrent of warmth and connection with, you know, Mayor Pete and, oh, he's this. And people don't feel that with Stacey Abrams. So I wanted to try to convey the warmth and affection and appreciation I have for these people who is I Is it because she's know. so cerebral or is it the misogynoir or what are you kind of getting at in terms of the name piece of that? Well, it's not so much for her, I think, just about – it's. It's more, it's more about the underlying issue around who do they resonate with. I see, I see. And I know this because I took Stacey around to meet with lots of major donors and very wealthy people. And then some of these same people, you could see it in their eyes. They would, their eyes would like 
you know, they, when they start talking about Buttigieg, they would like light up and like, oh, he's so smart and I really respect him. Whereas those days would be all like, oh, yeah, she's good. I like her, you know. And so it's like there was not the same. Um, and I think that that level of disconnect often will play itself out in the how I see. you so, refer to and, somebody. And since you know her, you wanted to speak with her and and have that relationship show through the way you're writing. Yes, so I wanted them to it. feel as warmly towards her as I Got do. it. So that made a lot of sense to me. The other um, other decision you talk about is using an uppercase B for the word black people and a lowercase W for the words white people. It seems normal to me, but I guess that's not the current practice everywhere. Yeah? Yeah, well, on two levels. And I wrote about this also in my first book. Um, and um, I also had a little bit. I mean, it's funny how it's not institutionally clear that there's actually a very good essay in the New York Times, maybe a decade ago, um, about the case for black with upper class, with an uppercase B. And because you capitalize African-American. And so if you're using black to refer to the same grouping of people, why would that be lowercase? Right. And so, but there is a practice of it being lowercase. And so I actually had some discussion with my publisher originally around this back then. And I was like, I was like, if I can't use upper uppercase B, I'm not going to use the word black in the whole book. I'm going to use African American so far. We'll be never able to work that whole piece forward. So there's that that piece. and I don't even think it's a standard thing in journalism yet, in terms of yeah. the standard guides or whatnot. They don't have upper uppercase B, which is actually nonsensical to me, because why would you under upper uppercase African American? So that's that part. And then the white part, I actually ch- changed between my two books. So the first book, I capitalized the W in white. And I wrote about that in the, in the author's note there as well. Um, and then frankly, it was because I didn't want to... I didn't want to get into it. <laughs> and so <laughs> people would be upset or whatever... But I was, it was an iffy proposition at that point. But I went ahead and capitalized it there. Mm-hmm. I feel like in the intervening, inter, intervening several years that the um, rise of white supremacy and white nationalism in this country is so pronounced. And this notion that um, white people are preeminent, mm. I didn't want to lend any additional um, support for that worldview. So yeah, I, I mean, I think it's it. now is the time, if there ever was one, to finally interrogate the notion of whiteness. Yeah. You know, I, I just, I always, when I have to check the boxes, I always have to like, I've got to choose white. And they say, well, are you, you are you a Hispanic white? Like, or are you like, they're asking these different questions. And it's like, but I'm, I'm Jewish white. You know, mm-hmm. every, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be associated with this idea of whiteness, even if I, I'm, but I want to mark it because I ha, I benefit from white privilege, but I don't want to, I want to interrogate this idea that it's a, a ident- that it even is a classification. So um, one thing though, that you didn't note, and I was, I, I, I noticed it is uh, you decided to use the N word spelled out in the book. Um, and that, that is somewhat of a common practice, I think, but you didn't make a note of that. And I wonder if that was an oversight, or if you deliberately decided not to even get into that? Well, I'm not sure how much it came up as a thought about whether I should. I mean, I am I am quite, I mean, you talk about the thing about humor, and I did try to in, intersperse that in there. But I, you know what it is, is that there is, um, there is so much denial in this country about the history of racism and white supremacy and it's the default is to excuse away and deny and refuse to face the facts. And so I wanted to put as much fact and real history in people's faces in a kind of unrelenting way to force them to face the facts and not be able to deny it. Yeah. And so in that context, using the N-word fully spelled out, um, I wanted to have people grapple with that and confront it and see the ugliness of what we've had to, 
um, deal with in this country. I and I and I think it it's powerful in that way, and I think you can for a number of obvious and less so obvious reasons. I think it works. So before I turn uh, to the subject matter, I, I I feel like I'm falling in for um, a little bit what uh, you mentioned the comedian Dick Gregory at the end of the at the at the notes, and I and I just want to read this in your words. Um, the civil rights movement got so hung up. Well, you, you described um, you described what Dick Gregory was saying that the civil rights movement got so hung up on black that it never got around to power, which I thought was again funny. Funny, but uh, no, I mean you know these 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 things about words matter. Um, mm-hmm. All of this matters and it's important. Um, so so moving to this to this book, um, the title kind of t- kind of is one of the best titles for predicting what it's going to talk about, how we win the Civil War. Um, but this, the central problem that you identify in this book is that again and again, too many Americans choose whiteness over democracy. And this is um, not just Republicans. It's the way in which um, the Democratic establishment and um, political consultants fail to recognize what you call call the uh, or, do, or fail to discuss the dangerous anti-democratic drift. And one example you give is how Terry McAuliffe got slaughtered in the Virginia governor's race. Um, and um, so in your in your book, I mean, you do set out this sort of historical pattern of choosing whiteness over democracy, the most recent one being the post-2020 election coup. And you go through more of these, but... Um, in terms of the structure of the book, right? You've got part one where you talk about how the civil war never ended. You have part two where you talk about how we win. And then finally in the epilogue, you provide this glimpse of the society we might want, that we might be able to achieve if we win the war. So why do you say, I mean, this is sort of the whole thesis of your book, but um, there, you, you talk about that. There's two different concepts. There's one that the civil war never ended. That's a mm-hmm. That's an argument. And separately, but that's not the title. That's not what part one is. It's how it never ended. You're like, you're like, you know, not even going to try to make the argument. And there are some people who would say, oh, no, it ended. Right. So um, do you want to talk about the first part of the book, how, how it never, you know, what you mean by it never ended and what kind of tactics um, that this sort of Confederates and their ideological descendants have used to keep it, to keep this civil war alive? Yeah, no, it's funny. It was originally, I was going to call the book Once We Win the Civil War. <laughs> and it was going to be more of a policy vision and, you know, looking forward. But it took so long to make the case that I had to be <laughs> really laying out the... And I did actually, I mean, I had the broad strokes understanding the thesis and the premise. But the more I researched and got into it, the more affirmed I was that this was, in fact, very much the case. And so, and I thought, again, back to this denial issue, that I had to be very um, forceful and relentless to really drive home this point, because it is not um, conventional wisdom, and it's not comfortable, this notion that the Civil War did. And it's what's fascinating to me is the reverence we have for Abraham Lincoln and that, you know, even one of the, whatever, current recent bestseller, another book about Lincoln, et cetera. Everybody loves him, right? Yes, All parties. Without, without and knowing he's him. held up as an example of success yeah. and leadership. Yeah. And this is what we should all be doing without anybody appreciating the fact that he was murdered by a white supremacist for ending the Civil War. And so that's not part of our national oh, dialogue. Steve, details, details. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>, so... <laughs> Um, no, that's that, really, that, I'm laughing at it, but like, yeah, right? Right. And I didn't know all those different details. That <laughs> yeah. the the Friday after the Sunday surrender mm. in the Civil War, and that Lincoln gave a speech during that week, we're talking five days Jeez. of supposedly surrender. He gives a speech, he mentions something mild about <sighs> black people voting, mm. and John Wilkes Booth says that means N-word citizenship. That's the last speech he'll ever give. And then proceeds to shoot him in the back of the head. That's not surrendering. That's not ending the Civil War. No. So you, no. that's the, you know, the jumping off point. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, looking at the... Can we just the, pause for a moment? Sure. And like, why don't we, 
Why isn't that the way the story is told? I think it's uncomfortable. We want uh, more of a feel-good story and um, a... Um, but how is it told? Like when we say, yeah, he, you know, he, he, she, you know, he's watching this play and he gets shot by Booth. What do most people think the motivation was? Like we just kind of like, well, I don't know. And actually, now that you we're saying this, now I'm, I'm actually after we, is, after we get off, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna yeah. read that Spielberg movie and see how he actually yes, treats right? it. I don't even but remember. We don't get to his assassination. What yeah. what we talk about it as. Lincoln freed the slaves and ended the Civil War and brought the country together. Yes. That's the narrative that people are comfortable with and that people like. Mm. And broad strokes, that is true, although he did task somebody with running the numbers and how much it would cost to send all black people back to Africa, because that was a solution that was on the table yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. But broad strokes, yes, that's true. But if you don't understand what happened and why, it makes it harder to appreciate the moment that we're in. Well, the one thing yes. I didn't know at all until researching this was that they put up these uh, statues and memorials to Robert E. Lee and the Confederate uh, soldiers, the Confederate leaders, decades before we put up the Lincoln Memorial. And they resisted putting up the Lincoln Wait. Memorial. Wait, really? Because I'm yes. thinking of most of the statues. I, I keep thinking about the ones that were put up during Jim Crow as opposed to the earlier ones. Okay. No, no, no. Late 1800s, early 1900s, a lot of these statues went up, particularly the huge ass one that just came down in um, Richmond of Robert E. Lee. That was like, uh, whatever, three, okay. four stories high or whatever. Jeez. It had been up there, you know, for, you know, well over 100 years. And they specifically and, re and, and, and repeatedly blocked the creation of the Lincoln Memorial, which didn't get created until uh, the late the 1920s. So that's, that's like one of my favorite places on the planet. My parents took me there when I was very young. And so I have a memory of feeling like the smallest person is gigantic Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Whenever I go there, I, anyhow, but not now I didn't, I didn't realize what a struggle that was to get it, get it made. I did not know. Well, that's, that's, I think the fundamental point about yeah. the, the, what I, you know, what I talk about in part one of the book is that there has been this consistent, what I call Confederate battle plan. And the first element mm -hmm. of it is never giving an inch. And in every single possible um, way of holding the line that this is fundamentally a country for white people, they have never given an inch. And that's just one of many examples. Let's go through. So there's, I mean, you may not know them off the top of your head. I mean, I know you wrote the book, but sometimes, um, but so the first of these, the strategy to keep that civil war alive, the first one you said is never giving, never give an inch. Never give an inch. And in that the, one of the clearest examples of that was the um, post-civil war constitutional amendments. Mm. And then most clearly was the um, 13th Amendment. Mm -hmm. And again, you don't know these things until you actually fully research um, the book. The 13th Amendment, which simply outlawed slavery, did not have enough votes to pass the House of Representatives. And it had to like do multiple votes and amendments. And it was a House of Representatives that had no Southerners in it because they had all succeeded. And they still couldn't pass the, first, the 13th Amendment originally. Mm. And so that's an example of, right. of they never giving them the 14th and the 15th. I mean, President Johnson, who uh, succeeded Lincoln, Ugh. opposed the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment in terms of you know, equal rights and, uh, and voting rights. So that's the first piece is never giving an inch. Ruthlessly rewrite the, the rules and, ruth and, and the laws is another part. And so you see mm -hmm. that after, the, after they passed those amendments, after they passed the 14th Amendment, then you had all of these. Uh, that's why you get to the Supreme Court decisions, Plessy versus Ferguson. It's like, right. yes, there's this amendment, but it doesn't apply here. You can have yeah. separate but equal. So rewriting the rules up to including... We used to have whites-only primaries in different parts of the South in the mm. 1920s and 1930s. And the Supreme Court, they kept going back and forth, like eight different cases, saying that it, the argument was, well, the political parties are private entities. They're not government entities. So they can have, they're not governed by the Constitution. So they can have, and so as long <laughs> as the general election is open, but in the South, where there were no, where there, where there were no um, Republicans at that time, that, that didn't make any sense. So ruthlessly rewrite the rules. But how does that, and that second thing, how does it come to, because your argument is that it's still, 
the Civil War never ended. So I would say, you know, that those rules are still being rewritten as the Supreme Court, right? They roll back voting oh, rights yeah. and so in, on. Yeah. In, in tw- in, after Obama got elected in, in 2008, there were dozens of states that passed laws restricting people being able to vote, rewriting the rules, making it harder to vote, yep. um, voter ID laws, et cetera. After Biden won, dozens of states again in 2021 right, passed more laws, voting, yeah. making it harder to vote. Um, so it's been yep. relentless and, and, and unceasing and actually fairly obvious you have to think about it. I mean, yeah. after the Civil War, South Carolina and I believe it was Mississippi were majority black populations. And so mm-hmm. they had to stop people from voting in terms yeah. of being able to hold on to their power. So that's the second part. Um, um, distorting public opinion. Mm-hmm. is the third part of the, of the Confederate battle plan. So this whole lost cause um, concept where they redefined what the Civil War was all about. And the most... Uh, to enduring, hide that it was really, to whitewash, you said, the white supremacy. Exactly. It. The most yeah. enduring example of that is Gone with the Wind, which is still, there was a survey in like 2018 or something, still like the fourth most popular book in this country. And it basically turns white nationalists slave-holding mass murderers into dashing leading men and, you know, beautiful leading women in this mm. romanticized fashion. And right. so they, they completely distorted public opinion around that. What what year was that? Do you remember what year that was 1930s. made? 1930s. Wow. God. Anyhow, I mean, just think yes. about participating in that. Well, I mean, oh. it was very clear that, you know— um, uh, the author was been a was a fan of the person who did um, Birth of the Nation, mm. um, which its first title was The Klansman, and, and was, an was ex- and it was shown at the White House, right? Wasn't yes. it premiered at the White House? Yes, and it oh. was an explicit response to um, uh, mm. Uncle Tom's Cabin. They didn't think they didn't want any right. sympathy Stowe's towards book, the yeah. so. That's an example of the distorting mm. public opinion going all the way through. Yeah. And then the other two elements of the Confederate battle plan are um, silently sanctioned terrorism. And so the rise of the Ku Klux Klan was, began right after the Civil War, six months after the Civil yeah. War, former Confederate officers, and it all very explicitly designed to stop black people from voting by through terrorism. And then there's all looking the other way, sanctioning it. Both presidential parties in 1924 did not have the votes at their conventions to condemn the Klan. Resolutions were brought forward, and they could not pass resolutions mm. condemning the Klan because they were that powerful right. um, at that point in time. And then the last that was, element what, of the that was 1924, you said? Yes. Yeah, okay. The last element of the battle plan is the um, playing the long game. And so I think one of the strongest examples of that was the— uh, Hayes Tilden Compromise. So at the end of Reconstruction, the, again, you had a contested election and people were fighting at the, you know, uh, election canvas boards in the, at the local level and there were people fighting over the White House. But um, Senator Gordon from um, Georgia could see the longing. This is 1877. And he says, we'll surrender the White House. You could have that. Give us back the South. Pull the troops out of the South let the slave owners take control again of the states in the South. That's the deal they struck. And that returned the South to control the slave owners and their descendants for a hundred years. Mm. Now, the hopeful end of that story is that that Senate seat mm-hmm. that was Georgia John Gordon's seat is currently held by Raphael Warnock, the mm. descendant of Martin Luther King. Who just squeaked by. Who just squeaked left. by, but did squeak by. Yeah. So both of those things are <laughs> in, in the in the I mean in the mix. And what do you? Okay, so it doesn't take much to convince me because I'm this is my worldview. But what do you for anyone who you could imagine or you have heard in the discourse saying, no, it this isn't still there still isn't a civil war. What are the what are the typical not convincing, but what are the most prevalent pieces of evidence or arguments that people will make saying, no, n- not only what they try to say, but why for people who say, no, it's not still a civil war, it's not still going, why do you think they're invested in not seeing it? And what are the arguments they make if you know? Well, 
I mean, I think the, the clearest example, the manifestation of this is the whole January 6th um, situation and, and debate and, and where, are we, where are we going with all that, which is kind of the irony of this whole situation. So the, Pope, the publisher of the New Press approached me in April of 2020 around writing another book. And mm-hmm. I floated the idea around, what if we use the Civil War as a metaphor mm-hmm. for the current moment that we're in? Eight months later, people carrying the Confederate flag, wearing sweatshirts saying MAGA Civil War, January 6, 2021, stormed the United States Capitol and tried to hang the vice president and tried to stop the peaceful transfer of power. So that's not... That's not ancient history. That's not a uh, 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 you know, long time ago there, the Civil War ha- happened. And so that's the clearest example. The majority of the congressional Republicans yes. voted to overthrow the elected government of the United States of America. Right. And we after, do not— After, after that. After the, after the, the right. people had stormed the Capitol. And they still voted to throw out the votes of the American people that elected Joe Biden and that were certified by every governor, Republican and Democrat. Right. So that's a clear repudiation of democracy and an unapologetic repudiation of democracy and continuing unapologetic to this day for many of these people, up until the former president tweeting out, was it last month, we should suspend the United States Constitution? And so... This whole concept that this was a long time ago, unless last month <laughs> was a long time mm. ago. So it gets to the thing about denial. I think it's difficult for people to live in a peer, in a sustained set of, a state of intensity and urgency and conflict. And people want mm-hmm. it to be over. They want to be able to just you know not have to have you know um, this level of um, conflict. But it's here, and so. Can That's, I be can I be the devil's advocate? Not because mm-hmm. I'm them, but what I, all of these we can tick off and dispense of. You, you'll hear, oh, it's only a few bad apples, and we I can see the vote though, right? right. I mean, but, the majority of the elected members of Congress, Republican Party. That's a lot of bad apples in terms of right. A few. Okay, let me do the next one. There's good people on both sides. <laughs> well, that's what Trump famously said at the white supremacist march in yeah. uh, 2017 in Charlottesville. Well, they, they want to have the good people on both sides, but then he wants to claim the insurrectionists weren't there, they weren't his people, right? He needs to say they're, you know, what is it, you know, anti-fascists. Um, uh, well, so this, the, it, it is yeah, on that ahead. point, too, because you had mentioned about Martin Luther King, and it yeah. does go back to what he had lifted up around the, around the white moderates. We're not going to have to repent, not just for the actions of the bad people, but for the silence of the good people. Yes, and so how is it that after all of what Trump had done, all of the COVID deaths and his irresponsibility attached to it, all of the unrestrained, you know, white nationalism and sexism, he got 10 million more votes in 2020 than he got in 2016. So how do you square that with it's just a few people or the level of tolerance for mm. this? is um, it's kind of breathtaking. Well, we're often thrown though, right, is um, as if these can be decoupled from racism too, you know. Well, it was, you know, before it was like economic anxiety, even though it was extremely wealthy white people who voted for Trump or we'll get, well, they just, my favorite is, well, they just care more about tax cuts. It's like, so you, you're willing to, first of all, that's really what's going on. You're willing to elect a white supremacist, racist, sexist, criminal, and you still don't ma- think it makes you an enabler of, of all the things that he stands for? I mean, how, how is it, how is it uh, that even if you're going to say it's because you don't want to pay more in taxes, let's, uh, let's unpack why you don't want to pay more in taxes. Where do the tax exactly. dollars go? Exactly. Who don't and you want saw, to support in the society? <laughs> I mean, right. all we, of we it, right? We've seen that in California, that the decline of support for public institutions. Yes, parallels the increase in the number of people of color in the population. Right. If it's other people, those people, you don't want to pay to support them. Right. Um, okay. So, I mean, I, I'm trying, I don't, can't think. Of, oh, I, here's one, one last thing. Okay. So some people will say, well, yes, there was majority of, um, of Republicans in the House did oppose the, um, you know, certifying the election. 
of Biden and Harris. However, in the past, in 2017, there were those five people who did the same thing with Trump. I mean, I have a response, but what's your response to that? I mean, oh, you know, it was, I, well, first of all, there wasn't an insurrection, but second of all, those were a handful of symbolic votes. Plus their concern in 2017 certifying Trump was that we just had that report about, we just found out about, about um, well, the Steele report had just, dossier had come out. We had just found about out about, um, about Mike Flynn, about Trump and Russia, all this stuff. So there were some questions, but it wasn't the majority. No one was doing that in a way that would have actually threatened, I think, the um, the transition of power. Plus, with the Trump situation, unlike with Obama, Obama had conceded. He was not challenging the election. In this case, they were actually standing with him right. and challenging the election. And then right. after the insurrection, I'm sorry, I could go, I could go on and on right. and on about yeah. this, well, but, just but I just want to, I just want to say that, you know, so, okay. So there are people who are heavily invested in ignoring this, but for those of us who get it, who understand, and we, and we look, we look at what, at the map, we look at these elements, the five things we're talking about, not giving an end to rewriting the laws to preserve white power, distorting public opinion, sanctioning terrorism silently and playing the long game. We see this happen. And so we're still living out, um, living out the civil war. We see people, insurrectionists, literally marching through the Capitol um, with a Confederate flag and on and on. So we know this. So if the war is still going on and we didn't win, just like we didn't, just like, you know, Lincoln didn't end it. It's still going on. How do we win? What's the answer? And so that's the second part of the book. And that, and that was like one of my actually when people, uh, friends had asked me, and she was Andrea Guerrero, who's featured in the book, um, what I was most excited about with it. And I, and I paused and I thought about it. And I was like, for all of my life, and you know, probably most, certainly people of color in, who are involved in politics, we've been told by really, frankly, the you know, white mainstream political leaders well, yeah, that people of color stuff is nice, but we have to win. So we have to put that on the back burner. And so I was like looking but can around. I hold on, is what, wait, can I just ask you, Andrea Guerrero, is she, is she the um, director of Alliance San Diego? Or? Yes, San Diego. Okay, mm-hmm. great. Continue. I'm sorry. So they said put that on the back burner. Okay. And that's historically been what our politics has been. I mean, I came of yeah. age in the 80s and the Rainbow Coalition days. And the, the actually, the whole thing about super primaries, the Democrats set up in, in the mid Rainbow Coalition, Jesse they, Jackson. Oh, yes, absolutely. I remember. We're the same age. I bet we're probably born the same year. <laughs> so that, the party has always been trying to downplay special interests, et cetera, and distance themselves from issues mm-hmm. of racial justice and people of color. And that's been my entire adult life's experience. And what they're thinking is, don't mention that, don't do it, because why? Strategically, they are mistaken, but what is their thinking? It'll alienate white people, we'll lose votes from whites, and we'll lose the election. And we never get more votes from whites anyway. And so if we want to win, we have to downplay those issues. And it's always been premised on we need to win. Yeah. And then I looked around and I was like, wait a minute, we're winning. Yeah. We we have won in Georgia. We've won in Arizona. They've won nine out of ten statewide elections in um, Virginia. They yeah. flipped the entire uh, local government in San Diego County and in, in Harris County in Texas. Though that's winning. Yeah. And so I wanted to tell the story of how we win, and to really document and put it back in people's faces. Frankly, yeah. Let's talk about what we need to do to win. And let's learn the lessons from the places where we have, in fact, actually won. And Mm -hmm. that's what the second half of the book is about, lifting up the examples and lessons from those places that are, you know, former Confederate bastions, in the case of Virginia, the actual capital of the Confederacy, and have now been transformed into much more multiracial democratic um, um, cities, counties, and states. I love your commitment to... investing in people, the real people who are visionary, who are doing the work. And, you know, I'm not surprised that would be part of your formula here. I shouldn't call it a formula. Part of your uh, recommendations here, because I see that in the way you write, right, uh, how you think about about people. Um, I also, you know, given your um, admiration for and friendship with Stacey Abrams, I'm not surprised that you're talking about identifying and mobilizing under underrepresented voters of color. It's like, 
to me, this, you know, as much as those of us who agree with what you're saying have always said, you know, Black women are are the base of the Democratic Party. Why are you trying to win a few more, you know, a few more white voters? Look at where they have been voting. Why don't we just turn out the vote more? Why don't we engage with people more, um, get people, you know, interested, committed? And how you do that isn't just a week before the election. I mean, this is, um, you know, part of the long game part of it. Um, what is the, what is that long game? I mean, what does that look like to maintain a voting base and to go up against an entire system, though, that's kind of rigged against us, whether it's the electoral college that interferes with the ability to have the popular vote work, whether it's the, you know, gerrymandering, the efforts we talked about, about, um, you know, trying to make it harder to vote and so on. What is the long game then in light of these obstacles? And so th- that's what is the, I try to lift up the second part of the book, is the common elements in all of these places that have had these successes and have had these victories. And so it's what we term the liberation battle plan, in contrast with the Confederate battle plan. And so it involves uh, investing in leadership, mm-hmm. dedicated, determined, disciplined, self-sacrificing leaders, which I call level five leaders, strong civic engagement organizations. Um, Stacey Abrams told me 10 years ago, he says, there's a million and a half non-voting people of color in Georgia. I'm going to go register them to vote. And that (laughs) is the word. I'm just laughing because, you know, she did it, but oh my gosh, what what a vision. Yes, and that's the work that flipped Georgia for Biden, that flipped it for Warnock, that brought you know her certainly closer in 20, um, 2018. Um, uh, detailed data-driven plans. Yes. And so really having a strong analysis of where the votes are, where the potential is, concentrating your time, energy, and effort in increasing voter turnout in those particular areas, and then playing the long game. All of those places that I mentioned that I feature in the book have 10 uninterrupted years of the same leadership doing this work, Mm -hmm. steadily expanding the electorate um, and really bringing in uh, uh, more and more activists and organizations and more and more voters, voters of color, and that then translating to the the outcome uh, in the elections. And Arizona is one of the clearest examples of that. Um, There's this really this young activists who were radicalized by the attempt to basically deport their parents created civic engagement groups, registered hundreds of thousands of people to vote over the past uh, decade. And that was the foundation that led the Democrats to win the Senate and the and the governorship in, in Arizona. Right now, where's the best place if you wanted to part, if you want to get on the field in the long game, are there certain organizations you think are good to, to start with? Yeah, so I, I, I feature these groups um, in the book. I think for 2023, I have to pause, what year are we in? 2023, <laughs> that one of the main um, battles is going to be in Virginia. Mm-hmm. And so they're one of the few states that have an election off in the year, off yeah. year. And so we're very poised to take back, the Democrats are poised to take back the state legislature, the uh, House of Delegates, um, Oof, the lower house nice. in the, that we lost yep. two years ago. And so the uh, organization, New Virginia Majorities, run by Tram Wynn. I feature her, her in the book as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're really a model for how to do this work, as well as it's one of the best, uh, I think it'll be one of the best um, examples and um, signals around the heading into 2024. So I really would encourage people to look at, learn from, and invest in the work in Virginia in general and the Virginia majority in particular. If I'm keeping my eye on the prize and I want to take a peek at the society that would be possible when we win, what does it look like? Is it all rainbows and unicorns? I mean, maybe you don't like rainbows and unicorns, but. <laughs> well, I mean, it's interesting that um, it was, fa- it was know, interesting, it's not a strong enough word, but the, the reality of writing this book during a pandemic and then ref- thinking about the kind of society that we want to have and the society, society that we could have. And so what the response to the pandemic showed is how narrow our thinking had been around mm-hmm. what we could actually do in our society. Actually, when the first, one of the first um, um, pandemic relief bills went through, like a trillion dollars, a couple trillion dollars, it went through very quickly. Somebody tweeted out, 
Oh, so we could afford reparations, right? In terms of what, the, ah, what we could actually oh, do oh, as a society. Oh, and so yep. we put. I use the example around you know universal basic income and the yep. different experiments in these different cities, and they're you know they're not controversial, but they're not universally loved. Right. But then we provided checks to everybody through the COVID relief. Right, Look we suspended that. the debt payments uh, huh. or the, the the rental payments. Yeah, and so and then you, you go more broadly than that. Clearly, we don't all need to get into cars and commute to big buildings downtown in order for our society to function or for the economy to function because they continue to function even right. under the pandemic. Right. So those and then that. What does that mean for the environment? And not have to have everybody driving so much. And so mm-hmm. the the my main thing is to expand our imagination. Yeah. in terms of what is possible. And the pandemic has showed us is that we can actually rethink a lot of the fundamental assumptions about the social contract and what our real goals are for how we want to uh, live and how we want to respect and protect and elevate the people in our society. I just love that so much. Um, as we As we finish up, is there anything I didn't ask you about that you want to talk about? Well, we somewhat touched on, but I think I want to emphasize this point about um, our perception of leadership. And I, I referenced, I drew a lot of inspiration from Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast. Mm-hmm. And she talks in there about how we're all um, actors on a stage that was built long before we arrived. Mm-hmm. And so, and the roles are predetermined in terms of who gets to be center stage, who is the sidekick, who is less important. And so if you think about it, we've had 46 presidents in this country, all men, 45 white men. So in our minds, the role of president is reserved for a white man. And, but if you look at the places where we have actually won, and I, the, something that hasn't gotten enough attention, part of the transcendent and powerful appeal of Stacey Abrams is that she does not look like that model. Mm -hmm. It's also part of the challenge that she has faced, but everybody who is not the thin, straight, white male model looks to Stacey and and can resonate and to see a leader like that unapologetically being who she is. But the fundamental point is that the the people who have been the best fighters have been those who are from the communities that are most marginalized and are bearing the brunt of the attacks in our society. So we have to so rethink true. our conception of what a leader looks like. Yes. And that's a critical thing, which I don't think is widespread enough, even within the progressive movement and, and progressive politics. I wish we, I really wish we could do that. I've always thought about different concepts of power. When I was younger, I really liked, liked the idea of wanting power among instead of power over. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think others have said, you know, we, is it Gloria Steinem who years ago said we were not ranked, we're linked. I mean, mm-hmm. this is all idealistic, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, or you look at someone like I've been thinking recently about Vladimir Zelensky, who stayed in, in Ukraine, you know, on the street and said, I'm here, um, a very different um, notion. And I think if we, you know, I think we should be evolving toward a recognition that power is a web in a network. Maybe to tie it all back to where we began, as I haven't really ever talked about this publicly, but Susan's main doctors were women. Mm. And her neuro-oncologist, Jennifer Clark, um, and it it was striking how different her approach was and how collaborative and how much about being linked and that not full of like ego and bravado, and I really believe that that approach of working together and having a different approach to what leadership and power and, 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 and um, activity is like brought her the kind of support that enabled us to survive six years and three months for a disease that had a median survival of 18 months. And I really believe it was the, mm. the approach of her team of female doctors that brought her that superior level of care. That is a, a beautiful story. How do um, how do people find you besides finding finding your book, How We Win the Civil War, Steve? So um, 
probably best to go to democracyincolor.com. And so this is the organization. We have our podcast there, but we can, people can sign up for our newsletter, democracyincolor.com. We do a weekly newsletter. I just did today. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> and so we put out, you know, featured key things in the news, some of the analysis, different highlights of stuff. So that's probably the best way to stay in touch with us is to sign up for that newsletter at democracyincolor.com. Well, thank you. And uh, thanks so much for spending this time with me today. Thanks for inviting me. I really enjoyed the conversation. I appreciate it. That was an amazing conversation. I think Steve's love and commitment to his wife shines through everything he does today. And I know that her memory will be a blessing. I was especially interested in his suggestions about how we can all get involved right now in 2023, testing out the strategy for winning the Civil War. And that includes getting involved in the governor's election and the state legislative election in Virginia. I'll be back next week with another show as we continue to explore the writing process in the nonfiction world together. Let us know what you think. You can send me an email at bookduck at politicon.com. You can also write to bookduck at P.O. Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061. To keep up with the show and our featured authors, please follow Booked Up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And please give Booked Up a five-star review. It really helps other people find the podcast. 